good afternoon and uh, good evening wherever you are in the world. My name is Joshua Shigala and welcome down the rabbit hole once again. I'm uh, I'm I'm joined today with a really interesting web3 project uh hoping to conquer the real world uh, assets not just assets but uh some interesting parts of of the space which is like real world loans and and lending uh micro loans b2b loans but we'll get more into it maybe I'm totally off the mark here uh, uh we have Kushik on the line and uh and oh, I, I I can't pronounce your name again I'm sorry for Pratish, no sorry, but I, I'm still getting used to it. Um, yeah, welcome to the show, and uh, and and welcome, Zoth. I, I'm really, really interested in finding out more. Um, what is Zoth trying to Zoth.io trying to solve, and uh, what what's the main the main problem that that you're trying to solve here? Sure, maybe uh, I'll just pick it up. So. Uh, in in a nutshell, uh, what we're doing is essentially allowing crypto users uh, generate sustainable yield uh, based out of real world asset classes. Uh, this is our first uh, product. And uh, the reason why we started with this is we have seen that a lot of crypto users are struggling to find good yield generating platforms. All uh, uh, high yield generating platforms that were promised to give high returns were uh, uh, not sustainable and they've uh, gone as of a Ponzi schemes. And the ones that are good and ones that are transparent are not generating uh, uh, like predictable returns. You see three to 5%, but involves high volatility depending upon the market conditions. I'm talking about the likes of MakerDAO uh, uh, or Curve Finance, et cetera. Good deals, uh, but then not, uh, not matchable with the real world uh, uh, interest that you can get. So, so what we have what we have seen is that crypto users are looking for uh, a better yield generating platforms, and there are good asset classes out there in the real world that generate such yield. Uh, but the major issue is that uh, they don't have access to it. They don't have access to all these real world asset classes that generate good yield. And through Zoth, we are bringing those asset classes on chain so that real world uh, crypto users can invest directly into real world asset classes and generate better yield uh that that is available out there in the market right now uh but this yeah, is the first just, I'll, way that we have. I'll just pause you there because there's a lot of info to be packed there for a second so i i i totally agree one of the one of the issues that i've seen the the community learn from which is really really important here is that during the 2017 run uh it was it was like uh, uh oh 100 200% returns and and people were taking them but very soon realizing that the inflation that that caused uh basically destroyed any of the return that they got so as as the 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 space becomes more sophisticated uh they're looking for proper yields like 6% 10% and that's high in the traditional world um but it makes more sense and the thing is, in a lot of the DeFi space, um, we're getting these yields in governance tokens, um, and and they eventually they run out and and lower, and you get all sorts of problems uh, down the down the line. Um, we 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 at the standard are, are fixing a lot of that stuff. But what I really love with what you guys are doing, you guys are taking the real world uh, where where people are borrowing and, uh, and and lending to each other for that are very, very secure loans. For instance, loans where one business might uh, need to pay for an invoice, they have the money, but they can't uh, move it fast enough. So they need that bridging loan. And, and these sorts of loans have very high return. I'll let you explain that later on. But what I what I wanted to say with that was that the, the returns are coming from an actual value add. Uh, rather than inflation, and and this is uh, this is really really important. I think step in in Web three. I think absolutely. So I think uh, the point that you mentioned in and around you know two thousand seventeen or just the the peak of bull run, right? Um, so yeah. you you got your your markets generally, which are uh, you know extremely overvalued. Um, there's there's a downtrend which is about to happen. And that's the reason you're able to you know, get those inflationary uh, yield, right? Essentially yield on top of yield. So you have strategies like liquid staking derivatives, everything which is which is you know related to the market again. Um, so even though you're getting 
probably 10 to 12 percent or or rather like you mentioned right those those crazy exaggerated you know 100 percent deal it's always you know pegged to the underlying market or the worst case scenario it's it's a rug pull waiting to happen it's it's a state of you know ponzi scheme um so it's i think it's a good point that you mentioned you know people have been you know looking at these kind of pro protocols for quite some quite some time now and oh and uh, is actually this is um, so yeah yeah it. yeah, yeah. so uh, um, kushik please continue uh with uh, explaining exactly what it is because i think our audience will be yes. very interested sure so um as you were saying right uh, uh we are trying to build more of an ecosystem because we be, we believe that the only way to actually bring in real world sort of economy or chain is through that ecosystem that real world traditional finance has established over a period of like several decades and uh, just by enabling a lending platform wouldn't really uh, uh, incentivize DeFi users to actually step in unless there is an ecosystem or unless there is utility that is built around it for example if you take a loan in the real world you can actually have multiple types of activities that you can perform in that uh like you know probably cross collateralization right you can take another loan uh if you give a loan to someone else on a collateral you can use that collateral to get another loan or you can uh, actually transfer loan to someone else uh, or you can perform some sort of derivative activities if it involves uh, volatile asset act uh, asset classes now all of these sort of like mechanisms are available in traditional finance and we have been seeing them for the past few decades past several decades to be honest now platforms that are out there it's not like we are the first platform bringing real world asset classes on chain uh, but what we are doing different from other platforms is that we are building that ecosystem so starting with uh, though we are starting with a lending product where you can lend directly to real world borrowers and generate stable yield but also we are building utility layer on top of it where your loans can actually have some sort of secondary market or uh, uh, some sort of different liquid staking activities, uh, which you can utilize to first of all get early exits, which I feel like is one of the major platform, but one of the major problems out there with the uh, other real world yield generating platforms. Traditional lock in periods still apply here because these are not so volatile asset classes, right? So if you see other RWA platforms, you see lock in periods up to 12 months, sometimes even up going until 20, 20 months, etc. That's not really the appetite for a crypto users crypto users want highly high liquidity or, or early exits so creating such mechanisms of uh, uh, secondary utility secondary markets etc will sort of give them uh, immediate exits which incentivizes them to invest here than your traditional uh, uh, volatile crypto yield generating assets and most importantly uh, uh, they want to invest uh, most of the platforms don't support a lot of different tokens a lot of different chains and at the same time don't have additional utility on top of your just yield that comes out of real world borrowers right you invest you get that yield that's it there's no additional utility that you get on top of your investments so we are also solving for that where we are allowing utilities such as liquid staking uh, where you can actually stake your tokens, uh, which you receive on top of your loans or investments on the platform, and you can generate additional yield uh, through the secondary markets that we are building. So, creations okay. like these would uh, be the first step towards building the complete real world economy on chain. Uh, but, but I would say it's still a very early uh, uh, area to work on, and we're trying to uh, take sort of baby steps to achieve uh, the initial goals and initial. Uh, uh, set up done so that we can scale and build more products on top of it. So yeah, that's right. that's a longer vision. Very good. So uh, let, let's break this down a little bit um, in terms of for the user. Uh, first of all, what chain, where, where are you, wh what chain are you working on? So currently we have deployed our previous pools on uh, both Ethereum and Power Polygon, uh, but we want to be multi-chain. So that's the target because uh at the why? end we why do you want to be why do you want to be yes. multi-chain so the idea is that to bring in uh e players from different ecosystems so we are in yield generating platform and we are bringing real world asset classes and there will be a scenario in future where we also might have to target uh customers who are not crypto savvy or, or who are not really completely into crypto 
though we are targeting such audience now, when we reach a scale, we want to, if you look at Polygon, a lot of Polygon users are not really crypto natives, but still they are generating good activity on chains. And the way that we can only achieve it is by reducing the frictional points of onboarding to only a fixed chain through only wallets. Such things will sort of like uh, minimize, though, yeah, we want to be decentralized. We want to have complete, uh, we want to give a complete permissionless model with non-custodial wallets. We still want to do that. We don't want to sacrifice the benefits that blockchain gives. But at the same time, we want to acquire as many different customers as possible. And the only way to do that is by being multi-chain. And, yeah. and uh, the, the way that in our infrastructure works, it's not restrictive to uh, transactions per second. We don't uh, we are scalable across different chains. We don't have restrictions with the chains functionality. The only uh, 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 way uh, to achieve this in the beginning is by expanding into EVM ecosystem and then possibly to other chains as well. So yeah, okay. that's that's the reason. So um, I, I agree. Like the thing is with the cross chain, it's that, that's part for me. That's part of decentralization because. Uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues in the Bitcoin Maxi space would say, well, Ethereum's not set decentralized enough. But I, I feel like the, the fact that they're so embraced layer twos and competition in the layer twos, it's far more decentralized now because these technologies, if one fails, it's not going to kill the whole thing. It's, it's, and, it's, and you it's, have to look at the roadmap of the technologies as well, right? Like uh, Ethereum roadmap still looks pretty solid with respect to the coming uh coming layers of uh plans which kind of adds up to that decentralization uh which keeps us excited to be uh at least start with the with the evm ecosystem first so okay i, I want to quickly just ask also uh for you gentlemen the, the the biggest concern that most people have with real world assets and we worked um you know i started the bitcoin physical gold exchange voltoro back in 2014 we started building it the first bitcoin gold exchange and then launched in 2015. this so we have a lot of understanding of physical assets and and mixing that and amalgamating that with with digital assets the big thing that most people have is trust you know trust in that in that interface between the physical and the digital there's one side to that but the second side to that because you guys are dealing in debt-based instruments in the physical world um uh, debt-based instruments in the physical world are based on um are based on on, on reputation and and a, and a black mark against your credit score Whereas in the digital, uh, in, in the blockchain space, it's based on collateral and over collateralization, at, at, at mostly. Um, how do you guys deal with that? If someone lends, let's say, some USDC into into Zosta, Zosta.io, and and you guys then lend it, uh, or in, well, it's not you guys, right? Smart contracts. So I'm lending it into a into a contract that is lending a, a project certain amount of capital. Um, how do you got how, how does the protocol determine security of that that person do you guys is there a central uh, sort of DAO that 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 uh vets uh, a contract or uh, d does the user that's lending do that it, how does that work oh there's no volume you're on mute there uh, yeah Am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, something just came up. So Kaushik had to make a move. But yeah, yeah. I, I'll take that. Uh, he'll be but back. Hang on. Your, your microphone is mute and you're going through Kaushik's microphone. Yeah, we are sitting in the same room. Oh, okay. All right. So this is just quite different. It's uh, just, I don't know if the that. vision might. Okay, but you go for it. Yeah. Is, is the audio and everything clear with that? Yes, it's good. Got it. So yeah, to essentially come back to to your question, right? Um, so what we're doing, we completely understand. Um, you know, trust is is a very concrete factor when it comes to real world assets. So what we do um, as of now is is essentially you know partner. We have a couple of models in which we you know source these assets. One is uh, you know of course di direct sourcing. Um, you know, Pritam, who's our founder, comes from a um, you know fintech background, working at ABN Bank. He was leading the global digital innovation now in fintech where uh, he's deployed over 200 million dollars worth of loans in markets like africa to actually you know finance these smbs um so so with regards to this we we kind of understand the model 
uh, we know how financing works and the entire due diligence betting process is pretty solid me personally i come from a risk background having worked at you know open financial which is um, one of the largest neo banks based out of india um so yeah with regards to these expertise um how traditional finance works is we need to have a concrete due diligence process in in place where uh, you know we look at things like the buyer and seller's relationship um and and what is the trade history been like has there been any default and we so all these all these vetting processes go on and what we do on top of that is take insurance on the entire underlying asset class so having taking this this insuring allows us to you know do the underwriting process through the insurance provider as well so there are multiple layers of security when when it comes to you know these these products that we do right so that's how we ensure that um, you know default is is as minimal as possible having said that you know trade finance and invoice factoring which is the first you know product that we started with is a highly you know secure form of uh, you know finance it's well, hey, based finance. Take that because I, I do want the audience to understand what that is uh, a little Absolutely. bit more but before we go there i just want to step back a bit so <clears throat> to truly understand the model so there, is there a dow that is vetting this or is it a central company uh, that's based yeah. somewhere that's that's uh, structured and uh, old school centralized company that then say okay you're allowed in to build a product that the blockchain space can it, it then becomes yeah. decentralized in terms of uh you know anyone from anywhere if you're sitting in Myanmar or, or or Finland, it doesn't matter. You can you can put some capital into these loans, and and it'll work. Um, but is that how it works, or is there a DAO yeah. that's that's doing this? So it's a DAO. Uh, it's a DAO uh, as of now. But the problem with DAOs is that it's DAOs are only good if you have enough participants in it, right? So uh, that's that's the uh, so what Pratyush has given is from the sourcing side to make sure that the trust factor is enabled because it's real world. Uh, we have to be both compliant in the real world, but also both trust, I mean trustworthy on chain as well, right? So what Pratyush uh, talked about is more on the real world compliance part, where the way that we are sourcing asset classes, the way that we are insuring them, the way that we are mitigating risk in terms of sourcing the right borrowers. So that is where the most important part of like sourcing comes up. Uh, but as we are early stage right now, uh, what we're doing is more through third party expertise, uh, through internal expertise, et cetera. But from the protocols roadmap uh, and the vision of the protocol is uh, there's something that we have laid out in our early uh, light paper as well. Uh, the vision is that we want to decentralize this process and the way that we're doing uh, because governance as there is like a real world party involved at the end borrowers have to be real world and uh and might not be these guys are like coming from emerging markets they might not be tech savvy all they care about is getting the money right on time as promised and they pay their uh, interest right so uh to enable this ecosystem where there's like a one party which is off technology and one is completely into technology uh garnage plays a crucial role uh, to make sure that the trust factor is enabled. Now, the way it works is maybe I'll give a high level view that uh, we have in uh, in uh, that we're building right now is that when uh, though the sourcing of the assets and also the on uh, the underwriting and also risk mitigation strategies, etc. happen in the real world by third parties and also by Zoth internally as a part of the DAO the actual validation of the underwriting terms and also the actual validation of the uh, credit assessment of the borrower is done by on-chain validators and then only the asset gets listed on the marketplace or the pool so uh, the way let's, let's just quickly because that's just a word for many people they don't know what that is yes, so yes. what does yes, that mean yes. So what it means that we have certain uh nodes that can onboard onto the platform we interview them it's a it's uh it, they they can't be anonymous they have to kyc themselves and at the same time they have to have a stake in the platform through our tokens so a uh, typical uh way that we're doing is at least a five thousand dollar to ten thousand dollars stake in the uh in the ecosystem uh to essentially make sure that they are they have a skin in the game and now what happens is they validate everything uh that comes up to them by Zot foundation these guys are third party agencies that directly submit to the validators and these guys validate uh, the process of uh, underwriting validate the process of making sure that the asset class and the borrowers are correct 
And then uh, it's not just by one validator. The asset itself is transferred to multiple validators because at the end, we are a protocol that is bringing real world borrowers, right? We don't expect like 100,000 borrowers coming up in one day uh, congesting the system. So these are very uh, one time transactions which happen once in every uh, few days. So that's where the validators will have enough time to actually validate the asset class. And there will be multiple validators present in the ecosystem. And uh, once they accept it, that's only when the platform is listing that asset class. Okay. And in well, case let, me, yeah. let me just, um, because it's a, it can be very confusing for the listener. So I just want to make sure that they understand it uh, yes. from the principle. So there, there's been many a protocol in the past that have failed on real world lending. And they failed because uh, they just were very consumer based. So people would borrow Bitcoin. One, for instance, a friend of mine worked out called Purse.io. Uh, and it was very early on. Uh, I think it was Purse. Anyway, I've forgotten the name of it. But you, you basically, oh, I want a loan in Bitcoin. And you had to pay it back in Bitcoin. And of course, many people just went there and never paid it back. And Bitcoin went through the moon and it was, uh, you know, it was, it was crappy. Uh, but you guys aren't focusing on on uh, retail, someone coming along and saying, hey, I want to learn. Uh, you guys are focusing on something else. Can you can you just explain that core business so yeah. that, that people understand? Yeah. Because it's we a legacy not, business, right? Yes, yes. So we are not uh, giving personal loans. That's uh, clearly at least not in our roadmap right now. Because personal loans generally are very difficult to validate when you, when you come on to, even on chain, right? Personal loans can always be tricky. Uh, there are scenarios people are sort of making sure that no flash state sort of happens and no black swan events happen, but then still personal loans are difficult unless there is like a con. Green collateral involved. These guys are pretty big and they're, uh, they're one of the best platforms out there uh, that I've seen on crypto. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the challenge with personal loans in real world is you, it's very difficult to sort of uh, uh, understand the credit uh, uh, risk of the of the borrower because uh, it's very hard to get credit details of a personal, uh, of, a, of an individual, well, not only especially that, like, on, the, on, the, on the individual side, it's very easy to scam those sort of systems, yes. uh, especially nowadays yes, with yes. fake IDs and all the rest of it. So yes. it's a very dangerous business. Uh, and I think the whole world should be moving away from zero collateral loans, personal yes, loans yes. anyway. Yes. Because it's, it's just... and, and mostly in Southeast Asia, if you see there are thousands of applications which give personal loans to uh, uh, users, especially in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and even in Southeast Asia, like, you know, smaller checks, like $500, or even like sometimes even like $50, $100, uh, loans that they have been giving without proper credit understanding, no collateral involved, they all were doomed to fail. Most of the most of these platforms are already dead right now, or in some sort of that's right. uh, issue that's right. with the regulations as well, right? Yeah. So that's where, uh, and it's very hard to be compliant when you don't understand your borrower. Uh, that's both on chain and off chain. That's what happened to FTX. That's what happened to a lot of different banks also. Even so, the way that we are approaching this is more towards institutional capital uh, from the borrower's side. We are focusing on emerging uh, market businesses right now, but we want to expand into that. But because emerging market businesses are pretty huge in terms of market space as well. You have uh, a market size of over a trillion dollars right here. Uh, and we want to focus on that. Uh, our in entire agenda is to uplift the businesses in emerging nations. And the reason also is because these guys have lowest default rates that you see uh, across different, especially the asset classes that we're focusing, they have the least default rates. And at the same time, they also have uh, uh, much more better uh, 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 interest rates that people are ready to pay because the nature of interest rates here is very different from like that of developed nations. You see interest rates ranging from 14% to 15%, sometimes going up to 24% as well, right? So these are, and also most of these businesses are coming from nations who are essentially bringing up their businesses who are emerging into the uh, global economy and, so, and we believe can, I just, can i just quickly uh, jump in there so for, for the user <clears throat> it's basically just to really get because uh, we can go into those details in a minute but the loan is basically for businesses like some uh, a manufacturer that wants to manufacture uh, uh pens 
they've got a huge order for pens. So the order, the invoice is there, but they need the capital to create the pens first. And so the order's there, they're ready to do it. Uh, they need the capital to make the pens. The invoices are ready to go. They will, as soon as they're made, they will send and the money comes that way. But they, they it's kind of like a, the old school futures contract. Why you would, yes. farmer would, yes. farmer would uh, want the money for the seeds up front and, yes. and then sell at that time. So, so and and they're willing to pay a, a quite a good percentage to get that credit, and it's well secured because you already have the invoice and the contract in place for final payment uh, on delivery, and and it's just so the audience know. Ah, okay, now I know what they're talking about. That's um, exactly right. Sorry. So maybe Pratik, you can give a view on uh, certain other asset classes that we're targeting as well. For example, into ESG sure. uh, assets and into asset leasing as well. So it's not just invoice though we have launched certain pools with invoice uh, factoring in place uh, which you've explained perfectly right now uh, but we are also uh, looking into expanding into other asset classes and pratish will give you a view absolutely so i think josh that was that was a pretty clear example of how invoice factoring as a asset class works uh, but at zot you know the, the agenda is to get every form of structured credit product right so we don't look into any of those flash loans any of those unsecured loans it's all structured private credit opportunities, which which are you know ready to be tokenized and brought on chain. Uh, one such asset class which we started is a good example which you gave, uh, which is invoice factoring. Um, again, a form of trade finance, highly secure. But as we scale and as we grow, we have a couple of more asset classes in pipeline. Asset leasing is is one option. Invoice inventory financing, um, and also ESG backed uh, you know SMB lending essentially. So what asset leasing and invoice factoring are um, uh, rather inventory financing. Uh, it's it's pretty much you know two sides of the same coin I would say. Uh, asset leasing is is when a business um, you know essentially wants to have the asset as a collateral and do their entire business pro process through that right. Now for example think of an EV manufacturer. So we've partnered with an EV manufacturer, local manufacturer in India. Um, so they have you know components within to build that entire EV vehicle right. So they need someone to come and finance that inventory for them they don't have the ready capital to you know go ahead and manufacture those products that is when the financing agency like like us or our third party we come and we give the working capital they manufacture the 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 materials which is required and they go ahead and you know procure the entire product and they piece it together so with the you know financing company the asset itself will be held as collateral uh, of course you know the asset over time it will you know deteriorate in value and based on that you you create a structured credit product out of that so you base your uh, interest rates accordingly and make sure that the leasing activity happens gradually uh, the tenures that you're looking at for you know leasing projects are uh, leasing leasing uh, financial products are you know roughly between 12 to to 16 months or or all the way up to 24 months here the concept is a little bit different so you don't get you get your principal plus your interest paid out every month or every quarter, depending on how the structure of that loan works, right? Um, so you have a leasing um, of let's say hundred thousand dollars for one year. This will be a leasing contra uh, contract uh, for manufacturing these EV products. So every month or every quarter, your principal plus your interest is going to be paid out by the manufacturer, and that is when you know the financing company gets that, and we bring it on chain and repay our LPs essentially. So what? Um, so, so these are very uh, traditional businesses. Uh, business these are these are traditional structures and financial products. Um, are you guys then? It's not so IO as the DAO going to traditional leasing companies and offering that as a as a product, um, or are you going directly to the businesses? So right now, as we are small, uh, we are looking at uh, the third party agencies or creditors who are doing that business. But at the same time, as the sort of protocol grows and we, we have enough uh, scale to reach out to borrowers directly, that's our aim to actually start from the, these are called asset originators. Uh, so what we want to do as the protocol goes is act directly source these from asset originators and credit, underwrite them uh, uh, by ourselves and also the DAO. Uh, so it's always, uh, because it's a lot of sales effort to Go into the real world and yeah. actually uh, yeah. bring in the right asset classes and also it's uh, also and you're you're dealing with multiple geographies as well right so you need the right approach to uh, sort of standardize this process 
Uh, yes, for now, yes, we are going through uh, third party uh, credit firms and also mm -hmm. underwriting companies who already do this uh, in the traditional business. Uh, but then we want to reach out to asset originators in future by ourselves. I mean, I think it makes sense that you guys uh, focus on the traditional business as well, who are already regulated, who have, have struck very well understood regulations in that space. And because then you instantly onboard a whole bunch of people because your product might have uh, less uh, less interest or more interest, depending on uh, the market. H how competitive are you guys compared to the market for the borrower? And how competitive are you for the for the uh, for the lender? Because th those two those two are very interesting. Because in the traditional sense, um, because the banks are creating the debt out of nowhere, it follows the the native interest rate of the central bank, presuming uh, plus the the uh, you know everything else that's structured in there on the DeFi space. You're talking about total DGENs that want as much return as possible and are not going to touch something below X. So where how do you guys get that balance right? Yes, maybe on the I'll talk more on the borrowers side and maybe Pratish will give a view on the lenders. Uh, but then from the borrowers aspect, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, as a borrower, I mean, I've, I've, we have done uh, fintech activities at AV InBev, and we have seen how, I mean, especially in Africa, right, and, and also in uh, 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 Southeast Asia, we have seen how difficult it is for a borrower, for a uh, for an SME to actually get a loan from a bank. Even the top uh, banks in this ecosystem sort of like struggle to generate, uh, some struggle to provide like a, a, a mechanism where they can get loans faster. The typical why? turnaround. Why, why do they struggle? Because why are the, first, taking that opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So first is uh, essentially it's a lot more difficult for a bank to. It's a lot more structured finance for a bank, and uh, to essentially uh, produce that loan, they need to do a lot of different checks, right? And most importantly, these guys don't have uh, a, a lot of credit scores. Uh, they, these guys don't have. Sometimes they might not even have uh, uh, option to wait that much. For example, the case that you're talking about is uh, uh, like the pen manufacturer, right? Now, the typical uh, times where the invoice is valid and they have to produce is, to be honest, around one month, right? And the payment happens after after 90 uh, days post the delivery, or probably uh, uh, 60 to 90 days post the delivery. Now, if the only way that people are solving this problem is by having a prior credit line that exists uh, uh, for the company through a bank, which is not easy for everyone to gain, especially in the uh, uh, scenario of, of uh, inflation and also scenario of uh, uh, competitiveness, even for banks. It's very hard for them to give in a short credit line for them, uh, as, even if they have a, a good credit score, even if they have everything organized banks generally take their time to issue such credit lines. And these guys, uh, two things are, for especially our borrowers, two things are pretty critical. Uh, one is interest rate. Of course, they want a better interest interest rate uh, than the banks or local uh, private creditors provide. And the second yeah. thing is they want their money faster. Uh, capital, uh, uh, lack of capital for one, two days is a lost client or a lost opportunity for them, uh, which that's why it makes sense for them to partner with us because for us the typical deployment type uh, time of a loan is 15 days at max uh, so we are talking about check sizes of 500k to a million and that's where uh, it's a lot more interesting for them to partner with us because it's a lot more faster but at the same time it's uh, a lot more cheaper because if you go to a bank uh, they make their margins which are pretty bigger than any other private credit uh, any other credit margins that you see on uh, on crypto and we are eliminating a middleman at the end what we are doing is incentivizing for example our validators are incentivized by zot token our our uh, uh, our all right. third party all right. partners are taking the margin out of the uh, out of the yield but it's pretty low so okay. and and zot as a platform doesn't collect a centralized fee right it collects a decentralized uh, uh, platform gas which happens through the transaction itself so that is a reason why we are able to produce much more cheaper interest rates. Okay, so Pratish, what about on the seller side? On the seller side, on pretty much. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. On the lender side, what we're looking at is you know a targeted segment again. Um, so since we derive our yield from you know obviously competitive markets like emerging markets, 
you're able to get you know all these double digit APIs. Now, if I if I go sell this as as a financial product to someone who's sitting in these emerging markets, it doesn't seem appetizing because you can you you don't need to go on chain to get those yields, right? You can go to any you know normal fintech market and then you know get access to this double digit return. So we have a very targeted niche when it comes to the lender side. It's it's people from developed nations, um, North America, parts of Europe. Southeast Asia being being few regions where you know access to to good you know sustainable double digit returns is quite hard. For example, in US, um, I think you guys consider T bills as one of the you know safest form of investments. Now it's it's giving around five or six percent, which is you know you know historically high. But um, having said that, there's since there's not enough you know market for you know borrowing capacity, there's tendency not to generate high yields in these markets, and that is when you know products like us. Bringing emerging, um, you know, emerging market credit on chain becomes very lucrative. So we we've started focusing on essentially, you know, DAOs uh, in within the DeFi space. We're looking at you know stablecoin platforms, DAOs, um, certain you know, NFT collateralization platforms as possible liquidity avenues. But on the CFI side and and pretty much on the retail side, we're looking at anyone and everyone who's happy with the double digit return from emerging markets. Are, there, right? are they lending in USDC or is there a capability of using your credit card and then it'll convert to USDC or whatever it is? Yes. And yep. then... So we have both. Uh, so for now, uh, what we are doing is they can lend into in any form of crypto. Uh, we have, sorry, we have two mechanisms of uh, making them invest by uh, giving out their exposure uh, uh, from that token, like completely selling that token and we uh, do the transaction in USDC. So we have an uh, on-chain partner who, and everything ha happens on the platform itself. We are talking to interoperability layers, etc. cetera. Uh, but then we also have a mechanism that we're trying to build where we also uh, allow users to invest and interact with the platform without losing exposure to that token. So the way that we are doing is essentially uh, allowing users to borrow on top of that token, borrow USDC on top of, let's say, Bitcoin, and actually use that Bitcoin to invest in us. And we are partnering up with, again, players who uh, take exposure of Bitcoin's volatility and give loan on top of them so that we don't come into that volatility aspect. Uh, so this right. is for users so that, who specifically... Where, yeah, that's where the standard kind of fits into this. You know, obviously, for the, for the listeners at home, I, I understand... What you guys do and that's why we've decided to, uh, to partner later down the track once we've launched our, our stuff but you know the ability to to lock up bitcoin or ethereum and then borrow s euro or susd um and then and be able to send that to you guys to, to loan out the volatility isn't there your your uh, the borrowers happy is that is that what you mean sorry i just wanted to reiterate yes, yes exactly exactly so yeah. uh, it could be Bitcoin, it could be any token. So we are partnering up with a bunch of players who are doing that for us. Uh, uh, for them, uh, uh, these are specific class of users who who uh, don't want to sort of uh, uh, short the token or who want who who know that the uh, token's price is probably going to go high in future and they don't want to lose exposure on that particular token, right? So uh, that is where uh, the entire uh, class of MakerDAO system comes into play where you can uh, get a stable token on top of your existing volatile token and you can actually invest that stable token in us and gotcha. we give you the on top of it. So that's one mechanism that we're doing it, but a much more uh, scalable version that we are trying to bring in uh, later in the future is actually on-ramping, but not your traditional on-ramping, but actually internal on-ramping within the platform where uh, we do all the on-ramping activities uh, uh, for you where you can uh, directly use your credit card or your local payment method and you can uh, we get that usdc we on ramp it and we get that usdc and we channelize to the respective borrower and it's the reason why we are only doing it in usdc is much more easier to uh, move money because this is these are borderless currencies right so um, so it's much easier for us to reach the targeted borrower uh, much faster than the traditional banking route and well, not, we can still be compliant yeah in in that in that example there because it, it always comes back, to me it always comes back to trustlessness so as soon as you start like oh you can put a credit card now there's a manager managing your funds and how does how does that go back into a so, private yeah, yeah. That only so I it, can yeah, yeah it's it's not like you put your credit card but you actually onboard with your wallet and you can import USDC into your wallet using a credit card you still I see. And then you move to the USDC 
I got yes, you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That that's very clever. Yeah. I, I think there's there's a lot of opportunities there, and I, I maybe it's a terms of use thing uh, from 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 Apple and such, but. I remember there's a, a couple of projects that did this maybe uh, back in 2018, 19, where they would say, hey, download the app and they'd have in-app purchase, like it, it would cost five euros to, to download the app. And then that five euros would be converted to USDC uh, or whatever it was back then. It was, I think it was EOS or something. But uh, it, it, it's interesting to use like some of these new fintech uh, things like in-app purchases and such, uh, and then on-ramp that. Because that's at the end of the day, as a as a as an industry that we're in, it's really useful to use these things. But the biggest issue is that a lot of these these sorts of things have uh, chargebacks. So, um, and that's the problem with credit cards. It's always been a problem for Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, being able to buy Bitcoin with a credit card means that you can have chargebacks. So people would buy Bitcoin, charge it back. Now they've got the money and the Bitcoin, and uh, somebody loses. So. It's uh, yeah. it, it's a very very tricky to think to thing to do, and I th I think it's one of the major issues that's held back crypto as a general, uh, into the mass, into the mass. But, uh, but it sounds like you guys are uh, are solving some of those problems. I do want to quickly touch on because I know uh, I don't want to you know use up. I know you guys are busy. What I'd what I'd love to touch on now is some of the more uh the, the questions that I think. I would definitely have, and that is what happens when someone defaults or a company defaults yeah. on their loan? Yes, yes, definitely. It's a question that uh, uh, we have uh, been asked multiple times because it's a real world problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pratish is the right guy to answer this. So, yeah, essentially, Josh, um, like, like what I mentioned right earlier, so every single asset or underlying asset is, is being you know, um, you know, insured. So first thing, not only are our insurance providers, you know, giving you know the structural insurance which is required, they're also doing the underwriting process. Uh, meaning that in case of default, um, what they would do is they would participate in the recollection process. If it's if you're talking about an asset class like you know invoice factoring, where the manufacturer is dispatched goods and um, you know the importer is supposed to pay the receivables or or rather the money back to the factoring agency. In case of that default the insurance would kick in, we get our money back and they go ahead and do the, the uh, essentially the money grab process from these manufacturers, from these importers. They, they send in the big boys. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So that's that's how it works. Uh, very traditional. And this is, means. This is much more uh, sort of easier if you're doing structured credit. Uh, and this is where the uh, individual sort of loans are much more riskier because there's no way that you can get that loan insured in any geography in this world. So uh, that's where structured credit, given that there's an actual product involved, there's an actual buyer involved, and also there's actual collateral involved. That's when like, it's much more easier to get insurance for these asset classes. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, the second yeah. model. In, in a way, you know, businesses have a lot more uh, in terms of credit. Um, how, how would you put it? They, businesses have uh, a, a collateral type, which is their reputation. A lot more than a, a personal oh, yeah. person uh, because their reputation they're trying to go long term and for doing a reputational risk uh, also for the insurance company so it's very very fascinating that that this is something that insurance companies will uh will underwrite i, I think that's that's extraordinarily cool and it's one of the first projects that i've seen in the space that actually utilize some of the tools that we've had in the in the traditional credit space um, to to get around fraud and, or or just accidents, you know. Some sometimes businesses just in the pen situation. Maybe uh, the person that was the, the the company that was buying the pens goes broke because of X Y Z reasons and then can't afford to pay the invoice. And the pen makers, you know, got this credit uh, has got all these pens. And the insurance company will come along and go, okay, well, uh, you know, basically we'll we'll pay it out the loan and we're going to confiscate all the pens and, and try to sell that or whatever. I don't know what they do, but uh, but yeah, it, that, that's that's really uh, it's really fascinating to see that interface. And what interestingly, also... towards uh, actually most of the defaults that have happened, uh, to be honest, the space of private credit 
and also especially in trade finance like asset leasing invoice factoring has seen like lowest defaults in any uh, sort of like world if you see like the entire uh, uh, like trade finance as an industry has generally the least uh, default rates in terms of credit compared to any other businesses like around 1% in the past 30 years so what that's the uh, yes yes it's it's the least amazing. because everything is compliant and people actually do the transaction once everything is underwritten properly structured and then only the money actually flows not prior yeah. to that so how much, now, how much due diligence can the user do on on the loan that's going out like when, yes, when they see like the box on the internet that says you know eight percent apr and uh, uh, and it's a loan can they click on there and see see what's happening yes. who the underwriter is the insurance can they see everything for yeah. sure. So that's the thing what we're trying to do, right? Um, transparency is key when it comes to real world assets. And what we have with us are these these collaterals, right? If there is an invoice which we are factoring, we have the actual invoice which is in a tokenized form, um, where we're essentially giving NFTs out for every uh, LP deposit into the pool. So if you go look at the metadata of that NFT, it's going to have information like who's the buyer, who's the seller, what is the APR, what's the tenure, what is the insurance like, and and all the other information that you need. So bringing you know traditional documents on chain through innovation and which blockchain is essentially providing. And so they all have the, full transparency. And all the transaction details, right? As everything is happen, happening on chain, even a simple, suppose let's say we wanna uh, uh, route USDC and sometimes if buyers don't accept USDC, we have to off ramp that money and give them actual uh, USD, right? Uh, and one good thing about free finance is everything happens in USD. So it's, it's a general, I mean, uh, Countries have just been pivoting to that uh, 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 right now in the few last few months that you see that uh, USD is uh, uh, being uh, uh, used still by most of the countries uh, in terms of trade finance. And it's a lot more easier for us to offer stable tokens to USD. In that case, even if there is a real world transaction, everything is still being recorded on chain. Uh, we're making sure that the platform itself is very much linked in the back end processes. Uh, where every other interaction on the platform, because anyways, lender onboarding, everything is happening on, on the platform on chain. Validation is happening on chain by validators. And also whatever documents that validators pass in are the same documents that the uh, lenders would see and lenders would be able to access in a tokenized format as well. But at the same time, from the backend deployment of loans and the status of the user, uh, of the borrower, everything is again given to uh, the user on chain. So that's the uh, way that we're trying to provide transparency uh, primarily to our end uh, lenders. So uh, Pradesh, or, or, or could you answer this? What happens when uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got this loan, you've got a whole bunch of capital that's moved in from lenders uh, who are ready to lend to a, to a certain contract. And, uh, and, and then I'm guessing it's a Singapore entity. Um, they cash out uh, this, this loan uh, to, to give the, the cash. I'm guessing it'll uh, be in rupee or wherever you are lending this. Um, what what oh, happens, sure. what does the bank ask? Because a lot of regulations now are starting to smash down on stuff. They want to know who the lender, where did this money come from? Uh, who's it coming from? It, it, does that become a difficult situation then if you say, well, it's just decentralized. There's a whole bunch of people that have put money into this contract. How does that work? Absolutely not. So I think here, uh, the essential is to, to answer your first point. Um, so the off-ramping doesn't actually happen in IMR, like Kaushik mentioned, right? We're dealing with, you know, trade finance only in US dollar denomination. We're not taking taking any FX or uh, FX foreign exchange hedging risk at the moment. So th we don't have that pretty much on our table, right? But when it comes to money movement and, uh, you know, the end off-ramping process. So one question is obviously where the money is coming from. So if you go check out our platform, we need to show source of funds to essentially off ramp and do the money movement process. That's so right. So KYC, yeah. simple KYC and KYB, KYB is the only process that you know works. Um, you can't. I mean, it doesn't seem like you know a completely decentralized or a degen way to go about it. But to be compliant and to actually follow these regulations and have exposure to real world assets. I think KYC and KYB so, is a vital. That process. is something we are doing that right doing. now in the early stage to uh, sort of be compliant. Uh, but the way that we are approaching this in a long term is that uh, there are two types of borrowers, right? One borrower is accepting real world money, and some borrowers can take in USDC. 
So when a case comes up when they're taking USDC directly, then we uh, essentially allow users to make a complete DGEN play. So there are and pools where you sequence. need KYC. There are pools that you don't need KYC. So we have different category of products that we have. It depends on where the money is going and also how uh, the money is being deployed. And yeah. uh, and one more important thing that comes up when you're talking about deploying uh, USD into real world in terms of real world fiat, you need a lending license, uh, some sort of license that uh, you need to deploy. So the way that we are approaching this is we are currently sharing licenses with multiple players in Dubai, uh, in uh, in UAE, in Singapore, etc. So uh, we will be so that allows us to sort of deploy the money directly into. Uh, these uh, 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 areas and, and directly lend into borrowers in these areas at least. So uh, this is a short term strategy, but the long term one is to make sure that uh, what we believe is a lot of people are in these emerging markets are going to get into the decentralized economy because it's a lot more easier for them to make transactions, route payments, uh, uh, which is already happening in Southeast Asia. So uh, as more and more, more and more businesses and individuals get out to the on-chain ecosystem, it's a lot more easier for us to deploy that money in USDC only, which makes us a lot more easier to onboard lenders as well on the platform. Yeah. Yeah, very, very good. I, I'm I, I'm quite excited to see what happens. I'm, I'm excited to see the partnership between the standard.io and Zoth.io. Um, it, it's 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 going to be, a, it's a wild world that's, that's arising. I think it's a very, very important one because what i really love about what you guys are doing is it's you know a lot of the speculation that's happening in DeFi is just uh degenerate gambling basically but uh what what you guys are bringing on board is the ability for people that want to actually uh, get a good return but at the same time it actually helps businesses and helps the economy grow uh, and and actually employs real life people makes makes a difference um by by allowing and, and it's not cutthroat or like paid payday lending or some of this nonsense that's really kind of uh vampiric in terms of uh in terms of its lending it's it's literally helping businesses by adding liquidity into the market so they can uh, function and uh so yeah i really i take my hat off to you uh, gentlemen and 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 zoth.io and, and i wish you all the best how do people get in touch? How do they? Oh, one one last thing before I uh, end it off. I had another question here. That did... the last one was with the Zoth token. How, how does that all fit into the picture? Because one way to earn, uh, obviously, in the crypto space is to to get a yield and, and such. The other one is to buy, uh, you know, a governance token and and maybe uh, partake in the in the governance and and also see in the upside of that token. How does that work? Yes, yes. So um, again, uh, it's a complex answer, I would say, uh, because we are building a. Uh, uh, what you've realized is building a real-world uh, financial ecosystem on chain is not not simple process, and it's not like a straightforward process. So uh, we have kept our tokenomics also for uh, evolving as the company grows. Uh, but the I, the major idea is Zot token is governance token. Uh, so it helps in like uh, one example that I just shot out was. Uh, validator uh, uh, incentives and also validator staking. So whenever someone who wants to validate with the right credentials, once they are approved by the foundation, will be able to uh, uh, validate a certain asset class where they're incentivized by Zot token, but they have to have Zot token stake uh, before uh, applying for validation, right? So that's one. And second thing is more towards the ecosystem that we are building. So uh, on the platform itself, there are two types of tokens. Uh, so uh, the one token is very internal to the platform. It's not tradable. So this is more of a representation of your collateral in a mutualized format. So the way it works is if you've seen models of centrifuge, et cetera, so they, uh, whatever investment that you've made, you get uh, some sort of like in, impact from tokens. Uh, so the way that we are doing is all the collateral, though it be uh, maybe invoices or it can be asset itself, uh, whatever value that has been validated by the ecosystem is essentially converted into something called Zoth asset tokens, and these are internal to the platform. So how it works is if you, you lend out $1,000, uh, 
uh, that means you own thousand dollars worth of collateral in the platform that's your representation of the loan right so you receive these thousand dollars worth of asset tokens which is one dollar pegged uh, to the dollar but then backed by the collateral which is locked in in the tokenized format now these are the liquid staking tokens you can go into the secondary market in the platform and actually perform activities such as liquid staking and these are it's a lot more easier for us to give users exits because now we are only dealing with one token so if you can create liquidity in the platform for this one token uh, you'll be able to uh, provide exits to lenders even before the maturity period of the loan so that's the idea with respect to Zot asset token and the way the platform guidance token works is to make sure that the uh, uh, platform is running well in terms of uh, validation, in terms of the right incentives for creating liquidity. So anyone who's staking uh, on the platform can actually optionally choose to provide exits, early exits to lenders, and they get the uh, 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 Zoth asset token in, in return where they generate, they start generating yield, right? now. For them, we are giving I a see. little bit of uh, Zot, Zot tokens and reward to incentivize the actual exits, actual secondary markets uh, uh, as, a, as a more of a market making effort. So this you see in traditional finance, uh, normally banks open up, normally platforms mm -hmm. open a credit line. So whenever someone wants to exit their loan, they give out the money through credit line and keep the loan and sort of generate interest. But as there's no banks and no sort of like decent or centralized economies here, we have to incentivize users to actually do that. And the way you incentivize is through Zot tokens, through the native platform tokens, by little, giving a little bit of boosted yield. So that's uh, one of so can the I, can utilities I deep, in as well. Can I, can I just depack that just for a second? So so i'm i'm a lend i'm a lender I, I lend something into a contract that gives maybe what what eight percent or something like that let's say ten percent let's round it um i'm like okay i'll get ten percent and and then you know it it matures in three months time and let's say one month goes past and i really need liquidity i'm, I'm like oh shit, you know i can't wait two more months i can then sell it sell my debt uh that i've bought uh to somebody that's staking it's not uh, Zoft it's not that's, uh, that's the advantage so there's no individuals in the secondary market so think of it as more of a, a make a model right so on top of every loan they are mutualizing the collateral representations in form of type right so that's what we are doing with Zoth asset tokens though you give out your loan what you're getting in return is Zoth asset tokens so these are the tokens representing your loan, your collateral on the platform. And now the- uh, the, So then you uh, can Zot sell your Zoth token. Yes, yes. So it's much more easier to create liquidity. It, it would be just one Uniswap pool to sort of incentivize liquidity. And the way that we are incentivized liquidity is because themselves are yield generating tokens, right? Because they- Sorry, you're by breaking up. Can you start again? Who gives out- Sorry. So I was saying Zoth asset tokens themselves are uh, uh, yield generating tokens, right? Because they are from a borrower who's paying out interest. So now it's a lot more easier to create a Uniswap pool or list the pool of liquidity anywhere else and allow people to actually give liquidity to Zoth asset tokens. And they, we, all, we as a platform as a foundation are incentivizing the liquidity creators to uh, sort of by giving them not just the Zoth asset token yield that they get in the pool, but also a little bit of boosted yield from our side through Zot tokens. So in our tokenomics distribution as well, we have given uh, some portion in the form of uh, liquidity rewards, which essentially is for liquidity uh, players who are providing liquidity. And it's it's more of the rewards are deflationary as the platform grows, the rewards are lesser and lesser. And that's actually adds up because as the platform grows, there's much more uh, types of different asset classes, much more types of borrower appetites, and also much more uh, activity on the platform, which we can uh, build utility on top of it as well. So initially, to make sure we uh, give early exits and also give additional utility to our lenders, we are giving uh, some sort of incentives for liquidity creators. OK, and you guys are based uh, on the Polygon network as uh, right now. So if anyone wants to find out more about you guys, where do they go? How do they keep in touch? Uh, give us all the details. Yes. 
Definitely. So, uh, I mean, you can just directly go into the platform and sort of like uh, buy this yourself. Uh, so that is one way. And you can also join our socials. Uh, uh, we'll uh, anyway share it some on. It's on the platform. But the best way to be to interact with us is our community. Uh, we started building community a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, until now, we were focusing on the business, but then now we are approaching the stage where we want to onboard as many as users. I would say there's some exciting partnerships we are partnering up with. Uh, uh, some pool players who are from an infrastructure side scaling real world applications and they're ready as well. So uh, um, so we're partnering up with them and there's some nice announcements coming in. Uh, and also we are uh, uh, launching several campaigns for uh, our users to interact with the testnet uh, and also uh, understand more about the platform and you know experiment before you invest in the mainnet. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's all on the uh, on the Telegram group, you can join on and get in touch with us. But at the same time, uh, you can state wonderful the and updates and on the uh, that we are active. Fantastic. And I'll, we'll have all the links below uh, this video. Uh, remember, folks, you can sponsor this video by a simp for the cost of one thumb up uh like and uh and subscribe which is absolutely free it's amazing and uh it'll help us uh you know get this channel to grow um yeah thank you very much for joining us uh today gentlemen and uh i wish you all the best with uh, with the project uh and the dow and i think it's uh, it's a really important one uh folks if you want to stay in touch with us please uh, uh like i said hit the like and subscribe but also join our discord uh, you can check us out at thestandard.io. Here we are, right there, and uh, and make sure you uh, yeah check out the Discord on there because there's a lot of really great info, and uh, we're to, you know we're just about to launch the standard, but hopefully, at the end of the month, um, uh, the first smart vaults will come out. Some great stuff happening there, so uh, it's really really exciting. It's an exciting time as the rockets, of the bull market, start to fire up um and and yes. you know some of the you know a lot of people say the price doesn't matter but it does we we do know that that businesses in this space start to get interest again um and everything that's being built during the bear market and it's and the bear markets have knocked out all of this crap and all of the scams and and left really yes. the solid businesses behind so um i think this this bull market is going to be fantastic we're, uh, we're seeing really great businesses grow, uh, great decentralized businesses and great DAOs grow. So I, I can't wait. Uh, we're going to keep showcasing great projects like Zoth.io on this channel. So make sure you subscribe. Thank you very much, everybody. Adios. Thanks for having us. Thank Josh. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure.